Welcome to Holding Circuits. Holding Circuits are truly amazing. Yeah, I actually remember the first time I found out what a holding circuit was. So a holding circuit is a relay that stays on after the signal that told it to come on goes away. Yeah, so it actually blew me away. I actually remember the moment in my life when I was younger where I actually learned what a holding circuit was. I understood relays. I got the fact that, you know, if you energize a relay, there are these contacts and those contacts can control something else. That, that wasn't a problem for me. But the thing was that I, I didn't understand if that signal went away, if it was a normally open button and I pressed it, well, that's fine. The relay energizes. But when I release it, there are some things that stay on once you release it. How does it work? Well, works with a holding circuit. We're going to unpack that. And I actually remember being blown away. Like I actually remember where I was the moment I found out what a holding circuit was. So I hope that is as powerful for you that you have that moment where you're like, wow, that is truly amazing. And maybe that solves some puzzles in your mind. You're like, oh, that's how they do that. So let's move forward and talk about a holding circuit. So going to tell you a little bit about what a holding circuit does and then we're going to kind of do an overview and then we're going to delve into a holding circuit a little bit more and um, this is going to be a really good experience I hope for you so um, I'm betting it will be so let's move on okay good so this is what's going on this is the holding circuit and what's happening is that uh, this is it's amazing of all the different loads we use for relays the most fascinating is the holding circuit yeah it's actually holding itself Okay, let's continue. So what's going on is that um, in this situation over here, we've got this kind of extra little line coming in here and that's the holding circuit. And it actually holds itself on. I'll talk about that a little bit more, but I just want to tell you that, you know, the relay is holding itself energized after the signal that told it to energize goes away, which means that a momentary signal can actually activate something and turn it on fully. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna learn how a holding circuit works. We're gonna put it into a ladder diagram and kind of see the configuration of it in a ladder diagram. And we're gonna look at how to hook one up in the lab because I'm gonna jump into a video for a moment to show you the video for lab four. And then we're actually gonna kind of unpack the different things we can do with holding circuits. So we can hold a temporary you know, signal, that's fine. We can do something that's called sustained closure. Yeah, so to kind of keep something turned off permanently or at least momentarily permanently. Yeah, we'll get into that. So, and the other thing is um, we can use it as a memory latch. Yeah, memory latches are pretty cool. So we can remember that an event took place and then we can take a memory latch and actually make a was logic with it. Yeah, was logic isn't real. Yeah, I just made it up, but it's good. Let's roll with this. Okay, good. So what's going on here with this holding circuit is you can see that once I energize this relay with that normally open push button, what happens is the power out of the contact, out of the normally open contact, which becomes closed, the power that comes out of that loops back around and actually is put into the coil itself and holds the energy to the coil yeah it's actually quite remarkable so it's kind of a kind of a little bit of a loop that's going on here so let's take a look at an actual ladder diagram what's happening here is that we've got this momentary signal that closes this and then that energizes the coil that's fine when the coil energizes we know this becomes closed absolutely okay so now there's actually current going to the coil from two places. It's coming from here and it's coming from here. Okay, so when I release this, what happens is that the coil remains energized and this contact remains closed, which makes the coil stay energized, which makes this contact stay closed and vice versa and back and forth. And yeah, it's a continuing cycle. It's pretty cool. What I want to do is unpack the things we need for a holding circuit. One is an activation signal. Okay, so we need to activate it. And that's going to be temporary. It's just going to be momentary. It'll come on and it'll come off. Or it'll come into the picture and then it'll leave. And the relay is going to latch onto that. Remember that or hold on to that signal even though it went away. The other thing is we actually need to make sure that we use the normally open contact from the relay that we're using to energize it and to hold it. Okay, let me say that again. The holding contact always has to be normally open and it has to energize 
itself. So it has to be from that same relay. Plus we need a termination contact. Let's take a look at how that looks. So, so we're gonna take a look at this activation signal. So my activation signal is gonna be momentary. It can come from a start button. It can come from, actually most of the time it comes from a normally open contact, but not always. We can use normally closed contacts. It's just that it has to be momentary. That's the whole purpose of this. So a signal comes from a switch or a sensor, and that switch could be a button or a sensor, and that sensor can actually be driving a, a relay, and we can use a relay contact. Yeah, so we can actually use a relay contact in here. We can use a sensor. We can use any kind of contact that is momentary. And again, most of the time, usually we use a normally open, but not all the time. Okay, good. So let's talk about this holding contact itself. So the holding contact is always a normally open. Yeah, so the activation contact isn't always normally open. It usually is, but in this case, the holding contact has to be normally open. So what's going on is that this holding contact is always going to be in parallel with the the activation signal. So you always put your holding contact in parallel with your activation signal and that contact has to come from the relay that it is holding. So if you're holding, you know, a uh, temperature sensor, if you're holding the signal from a temperature switch and that temperature switch is driving relay two, you can't use a holding contact from relay three. It has to be from relay two. Cool. So I think you get that. So always use a normally open contact and put it always in parallel with your activation signal. Now, this, this termination contact thing is actually really important. Let's just take a look at this. Okay, imagine what it's like if you didn't put a termination contact in here. Okay, so you have your activation signal, your momentary signal, and it makes, it becomes closed, and then it energizes the relay coil, and the relay coil changes the contacts, and it holds itself on, and that's all fine and dandy, we're good with that. Um, what turns it off? You need to have a termination contact. You cannot build a holding circuit without a termination contact. So these are the three things you absolutely need. You need an activation signal, you need a holding contact, and you need a termination contact for any holding circuit. So make sure you always put those in. Think about that when you're building your holding circuits. Okay, good. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna walk through kind of different applications of a holding circuit. And in this case, we're just gonna look at an example for a momentary signal. And I kinda of wanna unpack how we kind of configure a holding circuit into ladder logic. So let's just take a look at this. So what we've got here is that we've got one option and then we've got another option to turn a motor on. So this motor could be running a fan, could be running a pump, could be running some kind of door, could be running lots of different things. Um, or a valve to open and close, whatever it is, we just need a motor to come on and stay on when we have a, a momentary signal from our activation contact, which is in this case, just a start button. Okay, so we need to run this motor. So we can actually do it like this, in this configuration, or we can do this configuration depending on two things. One is how much current the motor draws, and the other is, do we need to add any more logic to the motor? Okay, let's just say the motor didn't draw a lot of current. It draw, it was drawing maybe one amp, and my actual start contact could handle two or three amps, no problem. So I can run it like this. As long as I don't need to add any more logic in here to control the motor, I'm okay. I can hook it up like this. Actually, I can then buy a relay that only has one contact on it. it saves me some money. There's actually less wiring going on here too, so it's a good way to do it. But if your motor is drawing 10 amps, and your start button can only handle two amps, you actually have to put a new rung in. This contact on this relay is gonna handle at least 10 amps. So, I mean, different contacts on different relays can handle a little bit more or less. If it's a smaller relay, the contacts can handle less current. If it's a larger relay, they can handle a lot more. But let's say the contact from this relay can handle 10 amps, and my motor is drawing five or six. Okay, so I'm good here. I can hook it up like this, but most certainly, if this is drawing five or six amps, I can't hook it like this because I'm gonna blow this start switch. Okay, so now, this is where I'm gonna talk about adding logic. In this case, it opens the door for me to add more logic to the motor. Let's just say the motor is controlling some kind of valve. Okay, so, um, and what happens is I'm gonna close this valve. So when I press start, the valve is gonna close because the motor comes on. Okay, that's fine. So it's holding the valve closed. So let's just say that I want to be able to override the start button 
and close the valve even if the start button hasn't been pressed or maybe I want to do an override so if I hit the termination contact the motor doesn't actually turn off so how do I do that well I have to put more logic in and the logic is this if start or switch then motor so I can hit the start button or I can close that switch and the motor will come on. In this case, I'm putting a bypass in here. So this pressure switch is going to make sure that that motor stays on if the pressure gets high. Maybe the, actually the motor is opening a valve as well. However you want to look at it, we can see that we've been able to add logic. But if I don't need to add logic and this motor doesn't draw a lot of current, this is fine. If this needs, if my motor draws more current, I'm going to do this and if this is true and I want to add more logic, I'm going to do this. Even if this is true and I want to add more logic, I've got to do this one as well. So it's good to use the contacts from relays or from holding circuits to drive other things on separate rungs. Okay, let's unpack how this works. This momentary signal, this energized, this gets closed. The current from, from the stop goes in two ways. It goes, one is to the motor through the start button and one through here through this closed contact to relay coil. Okay, so what's happening is that when I remove this, this is energized when I remove that. The fact is that that is energized and this is closed because that is energized. So therefore, there's actually current going here. There's current going there from two different places. One of them disappears and that's okay. As long as we have one, because dude, that's an or. The or here is if start or if relay energized, then Relay energized. <laughs> so essentially, um, if it if you energize that relay for any reason, it just stays that way. That's pretty cool. So and then we know that to terminate this, we have to hit the stop. As soon as I do, if I'm not pressing the start button and I hit the stop, that's going to terminate. The motor's going to stop because that's going to go back to its normal state and become open. So it deals with it can latch on or hold on to a momentary signal. Now we're going to look at sustained closure. Pretty cool concept. What we want to do with sustained closure is kind of close or shut a system down and just kind of hold it closed. So there could be some event that happens that it's kind of like, oh no, well, something happened. Shut it down. Okay, so maybe that event goes away, but you may want to say, well, I want to be really careful about this. You may want to have a supervisor or some inspector to come and inspect the system to make sure that the fault has been fixed before he allows the system to come on again. Okay, so in this case, what we've got is we have a situation where we've got some kind of tank and a mixer and we've got a heater in the tank, it's mixing things, and that system is going to be over 200 degrees Celsius. Now, the, the mixing process has to be over 200 degrees Celsius to work. If it goes below 200 degrees Celsius, something weird has gone on. The heater maybe failed or whatever. Maybe the liquid left the tank or something. And it's really important that we make sure if it goes below 200 degrees Celsius, shut her down. But if for some reason that fault went away, right? So maybe it just kind of snuck down between 200 degrees, below 200 degrees Celsius and then went back up again. Even if it goes back up again, it will not allow the operator to turn the heater and the mixer on. Let's follow this. Okay, so we know that it's just, let's just go there and say, this is kind of just a little piece of a control circuit. Let's just say that the heater is on and it is above 200 degrees Celsius and the motor's on, so the mixer's going, everything's just fine. Now watch this. This guy all of a sudden closes because it goes below 200 degrees Celsius. Now, this will become open when it hits 200 degrees Celsius. So, because it's above 200 degrees Celsius, this is actually open. But when it goes below, that becomes closed. Let's see what happens. We know this energizes. This normally open contact becomes closed. When it does that, it energizes this, and this becomes closed, and that holds it. Then, this guy also becomes open. Remember, it's normally closed. Well, it's not in its normal state anymore because this guy is active. So this becomes open and it shuts this whole thing down. Now, watch this. Let's just say for some reason, the temperature went back up again over 200 degrees Celsius. Well, even if it did that, this is still energized. So this becomes open, that's fine. If it goes back up above 200 degrees Celsius, this becomes open, but my holding circuit is holding that energized and this guy remains open. 
because this is energized. So no matter what happens, if I close this switch, this heater and this motor will not come on. Now, a supervisor or maybe a trained inspector comes along and he fixes it and he inspects it and he goes, okay, it's good to go now. And he hits that reset button. He activates the termination contact on the holding circuit. Now, if the temperature is back up above 200 degrees Celsius, then it's okay. So if you're thinking maybe if you're looking at this and you may actually have followed through the logic and you might have seen something not quite right here, actually that's good. If you just thought this all worked perfectly and you're just fine with that, then you're not thinking deep enough. Take a look at it. My question to you here is, it's kind of a challenge. Um, like I said earlier, there's actually maybe, this is just a little snippet of the control circuit. There's some other stuff out there somewhere. I challenge you to can tell me what it looks like or think about what it looks like. So my question here is, dude, how do you make the temperature go up in the first place? Okay, let's move on. Okay, so now we're gonna look at a memory latch. Now memory latches are pretty cool. They hold on to an event that just disappeared. So they remember events. Now, you know, just that momentary event is kind of like it's memory, it's, it's like it's remembering, but it's more of an application here. So an event happened and I want to remember that that event happened even like forever and ever. It could be actually, you can make a counter with memory latches. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So if you ask a memory latch, if you went up to a memory latch and you say, is that event happening right now? Your memory latch is going to go, mm, I don't know if it's happening right now, but I'm sure it did happen in the past. Yeah, so a memory latch doesn't know if something's happening right now, but it does know that that event did occur at some time in the past. That's all it knows. Let's take a look at some applications for memory latches. Okay, so one is pretty simple. It's remembering that somebody pressed a button. So the other is that maybe we had a key slot that a security guard put his key in and then removed it, and then it kind of holds on to that. So it's latching on to or remembering the fact so that you know the security guard put the key in. So inside the key, key somewhere inside the keyhole somewhere there's a what we call a limit switch and that looks like this so it's a pretty cool little thing the key is actually going to press onto this and close it so now when you remove the key this will become open again but this will latch onto the event it will hold on and create a memory latch in this case it's if you were to go up to this holding circuit or this memory latch and say hey is the security guard's key in the slot right now it would be like, well, I don't know if it is now, but it was. So let's move on to take a look at kind of reversing the logic of this. Now, as I told you guys before, it's just really a holding circuit and it's holding on to an event, but it can also hold on to an event that went away. Yeah, pretty cool. Let's take a look at this example. So if an event momentarily stopped. So what's going on here is that we've got some kind of machine and this machine, when it's running, is pressurized and it's up over 100 PSI. So it runs when it's 100 PSI, but maybe someone came along to do an inspection or maybe for some reason you had to depressurize the system just momentarily and then pressurize it again and remember that that event happened. So the event is actually something going away, the pressure going away. So how do we do that? Well, if we want to latch on to an event that went away, generally we need a normally closed contact. So our activation contact is going to be normally closed. So as I said before, very, very usually, most of the time, we're going to use a normally open contact, but sometimes we can use a normally closed. And that's going to tell us that an event went away momentarily. So take a look at this circuit. What's going on here is that generally the circuit or regularly the circuit's over 100 PSI. Now, for some reason, it was lowered below 100 PSI and to for an inspection and then raised to 100 PSI or above 100 PSI again, going back to normal. Okay, so we want to remember that. We want to actually put a light on that says, hey, this event occurred, so somebody has actually come and inspected the system because this little light is on saying it went low and it came back up again. So how do we remember that that went away? Well, we use a reverse contact. Take a look at it. So if I take a look at this and I don't do anything, the machine is running and the pressure's up. So if it's up, that contact is closed because actually that contact becomes closed. That's a pressure switch becomes closed when it reaches 100 PSI or if it's more than 100 PSI. Now, if it goes below, that becomes open and the relay coil R1 de-energizes. 
So therefore, the contact R1-1 goes back to its normal state, becomes closed. So all of a sudden, our relay two energizes because the activation contact became closed. And now, when the pressure goes up again, above 100 PSI, that contact becomes closed. Sorry, the pressure contact becomes closed. And then this goes to its active state, which is open, but the light stays on because we're remembering an event went away. Yeah, pretty cool. So that's a memory latch. Now, let's take a look at was logic. Now, was logic isn't. It's not real. I just made it up. I think it's pretty cool. It's a good way to look at logic statement. So for instance, I may want to say that, well, if something was on and now it's off, do something. Or maybe if something was off and now it's on, do something. And this actually has actually a really broad application. There are a lot of different things that we can use about this. But what's happening is that we're putting a memory latch into application and we're remembering that an event either occurred or didn't occur and then from there we can move forward and we can say an if logic so if this was on and now it's off then do this or if it was off and now it's on do this or do that that's pretty cool let's take a look at an application here so let's just say we've got an alarm that comes on if the pressure in a system goes below 50 PSI. Okay, well, that's fine. I mean, I mean, a lot of machines run on pressure and it needs 50 PSI. So there's this pressurized tank and we gotta pressurize it up to 50 PSI. And once it's above 50 PSI, then we're all good. We're good to use the machine, whatever it is. If for whatever reason, the pressure goes below 50 PSI, we have to let operators know, whoa, hold on, send an alarm. Everybody just stop what they're doing. We've got to check the system. Okay, well, um, what's the problem here? Well, the problem is every morning, actually the, every night, the system's shut down and then in the morning it's turned on again. So let's just say, it takes 10 minutes to pressurize this tank to 100 PSI. And by the way, I'm gonna fix this from 50 to 100. Pretend that says 100, okay, good. So it takes 10 minutes to pressurize it. So if we have a piece of logic that says, if pressure low, then alarm. Well, then the alarm's gonna be on every morning for 10 minutes. That really sucks, <laughs> right? So how do we deal with that? We use was logic. All right, let's take a look at it. So the tank is vented each morning and repressurized. Okay, that's fine. The low pressure alarm should sound if the pressure has gone above 100 PSI and then lowers between below 100. So let's just go over this again. The actual logic is not if the pressure goes below 100. It's not. The logic is if it was below and it goes above and then it goes below again, then send the alarm. So what does that look like? Well, use was logic. So take a look at it. This is pretty cool. So the logic here is if pressure was low and pressure low, then alarm. So that's our logic statement. So we're actually putting a was in here. And you know, I put capitals for ors and ands or nots. Well, was is a kind of a new type of logic. So we're gonna put that in. So if pressure was low and pressure low, then alarm. Okay, so in a ladder logic, it looks like this. This is pretty cool. Now, if we take a look at this, and when the pressure is low, that pressure switch is open. So that 100 PSI switch is open. Okay, that's fine. So now what's going on here is this guy is open now this guy is open too but take a look at this this is a normally closed contact and guess what right now it's closed because the pressure is low so if the pressure is low that's closed right now so the alarm is oh it's not going to sound because this guy is open right so what's happening here is that you can see that this says if was low and is low then alarm because watch this if it was low, well, R1-2, or if it is low, R1-2 is closed, that's fine. But R2-2 and R2-1, they are open. Okay, now, let's see, is the alarm coming on right now? Well, no. But let's just say the temperature or the pressure did go up above 100. If that's true, then R1 energizes. If R1 energizes, that is our activation contact. It 
energizes the relay that makes a holding circuit. So that's a memory latch. So now we're remembering the fact that the pressure went above a certain pressure. Okay, so now if it goes below that again, when it goes below, this will become open, R1 will de-energize, this will go back to its normal state, and guess what, the alarm will come on, yeah, because this is closed, this is was logic, it's pretty cool, and you know, we can use that for a lot of other applications where we're maybe filling a tank, and maybe it takes 10 minutes to fill the tank, and if the tank gets below a certain point, we want a signal to come on, an alarm or a light, or we want some process to start or something, but guess what, in the morning, or at the first, maybe we're doing this five times a day, the tank starts empty. So my signal or my alarm or whatever it is that makes something happen because it's low is gonna happen when we haven't even started filling it. So I want that something to happen only if the level goes up and then comes down again. We use was logic, yeah, really cool stuff. Okay, good, so as a review, we looked at the fact that a relay can hold onto itself, which makes a holding circuit pretty cool, and it deals with an, a kind of a momentary signal. Okay, so the, the contact that's doing the holding, so if we're holding on to a temperature sensor, or we're holding on to a pressure switch, or we're holding on to a start button, or we're holding on to an activation contact that comes from some event, something happening, then we always use a normally open contact as the holding contact, and it always comes from the relay that it's holding. So it's always a normally open contact. So it must absolutely have a termination contact. So your holding circuit's gotta have a termination contact absolutely, completely, entirely, never do it without it, or else it's just not gonna work properly. Okay, so the other thing is that holding circuits can be used to you know, hold a momentary signal. They can be used for sustained closure, really important for safety. They can be used as memory latches. We can remember an event happen, and there we can use a memory latch for was logic. You know, pretty cool. So the other thing is that memory latches, um, memory latch remembers an event that has disappeared. It's gone away. It only knows an event has happened you can't ask a memory latch if an event is happening. It only knows that it was happening. And we can we, and we can use memory latches for was logic. Okay, that's it. You guys are good for your lab, but hold on. I'm gonna show you a little bit of the lab and show you how to actually hook it up with a relay module. So here I am at Blackboard going to lab four. So you go down here and you take a look at it. This is a 15 minute well, video of me in the lab. Holding circuit. Yeah, holding circuits are remarkable. Now, so what's going on is this is a basic circuit without a holding circuit, but as we move a little bit further down, I'm going to hold I'm going to put a holding circuit in and it looks like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this short colorful wire in here and it's right here. It's really cool. So I just strongly suggest you guys watch this video before you even think about going into lab. Order by. It'll be a nice short wire that goes here. So Every holding circuit has got power coming out of the stop. It's going to go into the common.